Mitchell has his head up, takes the oh, oh, Welcome to the Junkyard Pod, hosted by Tony Pasta, Jackson Flickinger, and Corey Walsh. You can find all of our work for Fear the Sword and Write Down Euclid in the description below. If you want to be in our Twitter group chat, all you have to do is subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Send me proof, and I'll get you added. The Cleveland Cavaliers have dropped back-to-back games after a hard-fought loss to the Phoenix Suns and a not-so-hard-fought loss to the Brooklyn Nets. They have been without Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, Max Struess, and Dean Wade in recent games which has led to some unique lineups uh, being tossed out there. So I want to start with that. What are your takeaways from the Suns game? And we can just pretend that Nets game doesn't exist if you if you guys are cool with that. I've erased it from history already. So what's your takeaway from the Suns game? My takeaway from the Suns game is if the Cavs showed a third of that effort against the Nets, they would have another win in the standings and they wouldn't we wouldn't be too concerned about the late game execution against the Suns. Uh, yeah, the uh, the Suns game in the first quarter was a real blast. I was having a really good time. And then it was the horse illustration meme where as the horse goes throughout its life cycle, it's getting less and less detailed. And then you were just watching sloppy defense at the second half, only culminating in what should have bit the, the Cavaliers in the butt against the Timberwolves where late game possessions were just turning into turnovers. And then just the, the game got away from them at the end because they were just too busy shooting themselves in the foot. So uh, the Suns game, uh, not a great time. I think Darius's performance overshadowed a very sloppy second half. I was mentioning this uh, before we started, but there was an audible groan every time Niang shot the ball in the second half. This is one of the first Cavs games I've been to since uh, Niang has been initiated. And uh, the fans were not really happy every time he shot the ball. Uh, we got to see some summer league Cavs out there, which was fun and not fun all at the same time. Isaiah Mobley finally gets an opportunity to really play, and he's guarding Kevin Durant or not guarding Kevin Durant on three straight possessions, if you remember. Even Kevin Durant was surprised that they were leaving him open. I think that's probably more a result of Isaiah Mobley not being very familiar with the NBA as opposed to J.B. Bickerstaff telling him, hey, just leave that guy open. Uh, I, I think they made adjustments. Don't blame my but... guy Isaiah on that. That was <laughs> – hey, everyone was when leaving he was, Kevin – everyone was when leaving he was Kevin defending... Durant open. When he was defending was, Durant, like in isolation or one on one, he actually did a decent job. I mean, it's yeah. Kevin freaking Durant, he, so you're you're only gonna do so much. But I think he maybe fell asleep uh, on one or two of those. But there was everyone. <laughs> everyone was falling asleep. He had like three straight possessions where he just shot from the left wing, and it was like, yep. yeah, the, the whole offense is like trying to get him an open shot there. Like Karis, when you're running to the free throw line, not stopping anybody, but also giving up this mm-hmm. open shot. Like, what is the what is the goal? Yeah. Well, the Suns ran like that same high pick and roll with Booker for all three of them, I think, because the, mm-hmm. they knew the Cavs were going to help. Um, and also, I mean, like, listen, it, it's Kevin Durant, so he's always going to make it look easy. But when you have George Niang and Isaiah Mobley as his primary defenders, it just looked even easier that night. And I don't even think Kevin Durant was particularly hot that night. I think it was just like, really, like, this is free food you're putting in front of me. It was so I'm surprised night, he didn't burn right? us even worse. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it was, I'm surprised I he didn't like, go worse. I was just watching I mean, those I, possessions being like, all right, you know, maybe if Kevin Durant was shooting from all over the floor, I would give like Isaiah Mobley like a pass. But at the same time, just, it's like brother, where he's he shooting from the same exact spot. The boy <laughs> hasn't moved for three possessions. I mean, you got to give Kevin Durant his credit. You don't just roll out of bed and score thirty-seven points in the NBA. I mean, oh yeah, come on, guys. No, I was just talking about those three. No, points. that's why I said yeah, points. yeah, yeah. Those three pointers he always bad, makes it but... look easy. He's always going to do something incredible. It's just even easier when those are the options. Like, I think Dean right. Wade would have helped a was, little bit. Maybe he would have had 34. Maybe one of those threes don't get wide open, I, but I mean, I'm joking. I mean, Dean Wade would have helped a lot because Dean yeah. Wade is a really good defender, and that's that's kind of the matchup that you really like Dean Wade in because if you go – like, the Suns kind of toyed around with going small, and I think that's – you could have gone small with Wade if you really wanted to. Like, I don't think – Bigger staff would have done that, but Wade has shown that he can do that. I think the Memphis game earlier this year where he did that against Jaron Jackson Jr. Mm-hmm. was a good example yeah, of that. Yeah. So like he gives you an optionality that they didn't have. And in a game where really what changed with Garland is that the Suns just started trapping him a ton and just said, Hey, let's just make sure he doesn't touch the ball. If you were able to go five out with a Dean Wade at the five in those situations, maybe things look a little bit different, but you know, 
Yeah. They, de- they definitely that. needed Wade. I do want to... tried. Oh. I was going to say, Mobley definitely tried on possessions mm. to kind of put his best Dean Wade offensive profile out there. He took a few perimeter attempts, but, you know, we're not <laughs> expecting Isaiah Mobley to become the shooter that Dean Wade has proven to be this season. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's actually what I wanted to say before we I transition mean, to a little more Darius threes. stuff is that I think Mobley, all things considered, I thought that's Mobley played well. I thought Craig Porter Jr. looked good again for a, a second game in a row. They closed the game with him uh, going a little bit smaller there, and that really helped. I think they put a Coro on Durant, and that just opened up things a little for them, even though their late game execution. We'll get to that. Um, and I mean, yeah, let's just let's transition to it. I think one of the themes of this episode is I want to talk about how all the this never-ending carousel of injuries has really shaped the Cavs season for better or worse. It's forced them to learn different lessons. And one of them, which is pretty obvious, but the Cavs need Donovan Mitchell. They're nine and nine without him this season, three and six without him since the all-star break. They've had some huge wins against Boston and Minnesota. They've also had some very bad losses to some very bad teams. Uh, Think about Philadelphia, who's injury ridden. You think about the New York Knicks team they lost to. I believe uh, Trey Young didn't even play in the Hawks game, right? So they've had their other wins against the Pistons, which I mean, you should get Way to show up, fellas. <laughs> yeah. And so we're going to talk about Darius Garland here because I think what you really see is that Darius needs a player like Donovan Mitchell next to him. This is something that we've known since 2021. It's why they went after Karis LeVert at the deadline of that year. Because you don't want <laughs> – Jackson's throwing everything <laughs> off here. He's all crooked now. The production you don't want – it, <laughs> it was fine. I mean, it wasn't fine, but I was like, oh, I think I can do this really quickly. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> Back to my point, too. and I'll, I'll end my I'll end my rambling here. But you don't want Darius to be the only ball handler on the floor because we saw in the Suns game he can start off red hot, and then when they make that adjustment, he's just too easy to neutralize. He's too easy to trap and get the ball out of his hands, which most players are easy to get the ball out of their hands when you throw a double team at them. But the thing is, you can't do that when Donovan Mitchell's out there next to him. Versus as much as I thought Craig Porter Jr. played well, when it's Craig Porter Jr. and Okoro out there next to him. Teams are going to trap Garland, get the ball out of his hands, and he's just not that level of player where he can still score and find ways to beat you when you are focusing the entire defense on him. So they really need Donovan Mitchell, and I think that has been apparent over the last handful of games. Yeah, I think the like the Donovan Darius pairing hasn't gone as planned, but even if that pairing ultimately doesn't work, you still like. Darius can't be the primary scoring ball handler on a team that goes to the Eastern Conference Finals or or the Finals. And I think that's becoming more and more clear that maybe if Donovan doesn't work out, somebody like Brandon Ingram or somebody in that caliber is what they need just because it's really hard to be a 6'1 guard and, you know, play the style that he does and be bulletproof. I mean... You know, there's really only a handful of guys in the league who you can't take away by double teaming. You know, like you can't stop Luka, you know, when you Mm -hmm. double team, you can't stop Jokic. But Darius Garland is not to that level, obviously, and he's not ever going to be that to that level, which is fine. But this was this showed you why he needs to be able to meld his game to another high usage perimeter guy. Yeah. Yeah, whatever tier you think the Cavs are in right now, it's because they traded for Donovan Mitchell. They would still be a tier or two below where they are if it was just Darius. And even like, I love Markinen, and I think he's been great in Utah, but, and it's been a while since I've looked, I think like 70% of his field goals are assisted. He's not a guy who's creating for himself off the dribble, still a great player, but you needed someone who could create off the dribble next to Garland because when, and we saw it all in 2021, 22, whenever the defense is really load up on him at the end of games, he just doesn't have many options to beat them. He's not a physically imposing player. He's not super athletic. It, it's just, and he's also uh, some decision-making, even his aggression. I will say, I thought most of his process at the end of that Phoenix game was good. That lob to Allen was a bit bold, but if Allen just catches it a little better, it's a tie game. The same with the Coro stepping out of bounds. I mean, he was out of bounds by like an inch. If he's in bounds, they have an advantage. So I thought his prog- his process was mostly okay, but you see the limitations. I will say that I thought the late game execution from Darius was actually better today than 
definitely against the Timberwolves and Celtics, yeah. but it's it's mm-hmm. it's funny how basketball works where against yeah. Celtics, he's bailed out by a really bad foul by Tatum with like one second left on the shot clock, and then Dean Wade mm-hmm. comes out of nowhere and cleans up the shot that doesn't even hit the rim. So it was an alley. Again, it was not a, an alley. <laughs> and then against the uh, Timberwolves, like Gobert just gets the dumbest technical yeah. foul possible, and then and then in the ensuing possession, you know, Garland just gets blocked in a pretty bad shot attempt kind of mind boggling mm-hmm. possession. So so like if you're comparing it by that, you're like, wow, like this was actually like way better, but because Allen didn't catch that and you know, Cora was out of bounds by more than an an inch. Half it was foot. like basically, yeah. yeah like well, it was I, like the angles they were showing in the arena were pretty horrible. But it did look like he was out of bounds. Clearly. According to Brad Doherty, it was really close, though. So you and Brad are on the same page. And Brad had <laughs> well, like, the most clear sure picture Brad, of anyone. Brad probably thought Darius was throwing a lob to Dean Wade, too. So I'm sure we're, we're on the same page with that, too. Creative <laughs> gameplay from Darius. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you had to challenge that because what else are you going to use your time Why not? for? Yeah. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it was – once they showed, like, one replay, it was like, oh, yeah, that was definitely – he was definitely his whole foot was out, and it doesn't get back in quickly. You know the uh, the Darius possessions without Donovan just truly encapsulate why they made the Donovan Mitchell trade because it really just took me back to the uh, the playing games back a few years ago when mm-hmm. it was like, all right, well if we just get Darius Garland like kind of taken out of this game, we'll just let the Jims and Joes beat the rest of us. Not that Jared Allen by any stretch is a Jim and Joe, but like. He's a very limited offensive player. Like, there's only yeah. so many things Jared Allen can do to get engaged in the offense, and most of them rely on Darius getting him where he needs to be, get him to his spots. And that's really just a tough look for when the Cavs are in playing clutch minutes, and you basically are playing with unproven players. And Okoro, for as well as he's playing, we've seen throughout this stretch without Mitchell, they're very comfortable still going off of Okoro. And just addressing Darius, leaving everyone pretty much open, begging Garland to handle the trap better. And one he's thing, just not physically capable to. One thing I will say is that it's not like the Cavs didn't get good offense still. They got 36 threes from people not named Darius Garland and went 8 for 36 on that, which is a cool 22%. So it's Same like they were effect. still... Right. Like if they were still <laughs> generating... Like they were still generating shots, it's just... You know, Sam Merrill went one for five. Karras yeah. went three for ten. Isaac mm-hmm. Okoro, uncharacteristically, went two for seven. So it's, it's not like George. At all. No, George <laughs> George Niang went zero for six. So it's like that's on yeah. Favorite. If yeah, you know, Are you sure you read like, that one right? I'll let you try one more time. Why don't you correct that? <laughs> yeah, he went. He went zero for six. I'm oh, all yeah. right. Typo. Sources are confirming. Um, so it's just like. On one hand, you can see how they were able to take out his scoring ability, but they didn't, like, neutralize him. It wasn't like Darius Garland was just, like, ineffective or didn't Mm. have an overall positive impact on the game. It's just that if the alternative is, all right, we'll give up a Karis LeVert or Craig Porter Jr. open three, or we're going to let Darius keep shooting over us when he's 7 for 10 from three, like, yeah, they're going to choose... Carrot Silver and George Niang, mm. not Sam Merrill, but Sam Merrill just missed. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other point that I wanted to make with Donovan Mitchell is because I think when you look at some of their losses to these really bad teams, uh, not that Mitchell is perfect in this sense, but he really is kind of their energizer. Uh, he, throughout that entire stretch where the Cavs had the best record in the NBA, they were stomping bad teams. And it's because Mitchell came out right away with that aggressive mentality that I just don't think you see when he's not on the floor with them. Um, And it's funny because usually your best player doesn't play that role for the team. Usually that's like the Tristan Thompson type role, Lamar Stevens, if you will, maybe a Coro, if you have a more distinguished taste, but usually it's not your best player doing that. But Donovan Mitchell really has been that guy for them in those games where maybe it's harder to get motivated. Mitchell comes out and will just score 15 points in the first quarter, which I know Darius did that against Phoenix, but he doesn't even do that against Brooklyn, for example. Like, you don't see Darius really, except for the Pistons game, too. I'm kind of backtracking as I'm making this thought, but I think my general point is that the Cavs seem to come out more lackluster more often when Donovan isn't on the floor, and that's just something that 
you really miss him in, in these stretches because of that. Well, the biggest thing is Darius can't put pressure on the rim in the way that Donovan can. So if you, that's what Donovan does early. He just relentlessly attacks the paint. And when he's attacking the paint like that, then the defense collapses and he can make those simple passes out. Whereas even when like Darius just doesn't cause defenses to collapse like that when he's in the paint, like we saw where the Suns defense was really, where he was affecting the Suns defense was more so when he was on the perimeter when he was when he didn't have the ball, when he was in like those pick and rolls, those those high pick and rolls at the top of the arc, that's where he was drawing the most attention. But once Darius gets downhill, if he can, that's not where, you know, guys are just sprinting from the baseline corner and trying to take away shots at the rim. And and Darius can't make those passes as quickly and firmly as Donovan can. So it's just like it's just tougher for Darius to play that role just because he doesn't have the rim pressure like that. And the game mm-hmm. against the Pistons, like I don't have the box score in front of me, but he was shooting the lights out in that game. He had and that's six what threes he, in the second quarter. Right, and that's what he did in the first quarter against the Suns. So like mm-hmm. for him to have that kind of effect on a game, he needs to be shooting the lights out. And as we saw against the Suns, you can take that away a lot easier than you can take away the rim from somebody like Donovan without giving up other things. And I feel like if in the off season, if Darius goes back to what his off season workout focus was last season, where he got bigger and we saw the numbers get progressively better, having a career year around the glass, him just opening up the paint would, or just making the paint need to collapse more would just really open up a lot for him because he doesn't have the Donovan athleticism that Donovan can score from a multitude of ways around the rim not only because he's a great finisher around the rim, but he also is an athletic freak who can easily create his own pressure. Darius is just has to be one of those touch finishers where he always is doing the scoop layup to get over a defender. He's so undersized. He's not quote-unquote athletic enough to create his own uh, lanes to score. But, yeah, it's definitely concerning that you kind of feel like if Darius' shot's not falling from the perimeter, defenses are kind of not threatened by him whatsoever. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say they're not threatened by him whatsoever, but it's very different because of like the rim pressure he provides is always through Allen. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's a very different dynamic in a way that like it's just kind of easier to take away, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it. But I think Monday was also a great reminder of, oh, this guy's like one of the most skilled players in the league. When he has it going, he can get a shot off from, <coughs> you know, he can get a shot off so easily. Mm-hmm. My favorite play was when he had that inbound pass to Damian Jones in like the corner, and then he just quickly curled around the screen, took the dribble hand off, and then just went up and Booker could do nothing about it. It's like there aren't many guys in the league who can do that while also having the playmaking capability that Garland does. It's just there's limitations to him in a way that there aren't limitations with like top 10 level players. And that's fine, but you just have to find the best context for them, for them to be the best self. Something about Garland that also always just like that Phoenix game was infuriating to me because it kind of just emphasizes this conversation fans have where it's like, what is Darius Garland's like mentality game to game? It feels like he, like most players, I feel like when they go on the stretch that Garland go on in that first quarter, you would kind of expected that to try to continue, but it just seems like the water went from fully running to someone just shut it off entirely. And he just goes dormant for quarters at a time. And you're kind of just sitting there going like, all right, well, the defense is paying attention to you. What are you going to do with it? And it just feels like he becomes more passive than you would kind of expect players of his like ilk to be when they're going off the way he is. Well, it's just that just comes back to where he gets his offense from. Like he does. If you're a perimeter oriented guy, how many times have we seen like, oh, Clay Thompson scored 32 points. Oh, he scored 22 of them in like the second quarter. You know, Tony knows this better than anyone as the as the biggest <laughs> Warriors fan. Obviously. Right now. So it's, but like, that's where, that's where it's like, I, I get, like, I get the criticism, but I almost want to like stand up for Garland, which 
isn't something that I say that I've done a lot recently, <laughs> but like if you're a guy who is best at the three point shot and then getting teammates involved, kind of working off of that, you're going to be a streaky player who, you know, this is why like the late game offense is such an issue because, you know, it's like where he gets his baskets from aren't exactly something that you can rely on in any like in every single context you yeah because it just takes it, you back to those minnesota possessions where he the, the seven second offense turns into a quick switch onto nas reed and you're like you kind of only know that garland's looking for his three-point shot and now you're matched up against a near six a near seven footer and you're like you're making this shot harder than it needs to be right and it's but it's also like it's just tough for him to drive because of his size. It's tough for him to drive and like see those lanes the way that someone like Donovan can. And one of the things that I think is really the stretch from Donovan, the stretch in the, from like December to February or whatever from Donovan really shows is that he's a good passer, but he also needs to see those lanes because he's also not, you know, Luka Doncic height. So if you give him space and he can clearly see where these guys are coming from, he can really hit them easily. And that's kind of like the similar problem that Darius has with his height. It's just that Darius doesn't cause defenses to collapse. Like that's kind of what it all comes back to it's just where he gets his baskets from. Like you wouldn't like, you wouldn't give the ball to a, like, I feel like I'm running this clay Thompson metaphor into the ground, but like you wouldn't give the ball to clay at the top of the arc in the last possession of a game and say like, all right, just do whatever you want. You know, like that's not, he's like a, <laughs> yeah. the best, like he's best when he's more of a derivative player than a primary player, I think. So it's mm -hmm. just, which makes it hard to run an offense through them late in games or like all the way through them. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why, like, Sam Merrill, when he's next to Donovan Mitchell, his net rating's like through the roof because Donovan's so good at collapsing the defense and looking for Sam, whereas Darius mm -hmm. just doesn't have that same ability. Um, even like the late game execution, the Minnesota game is, is a good example because they were very comfortable playing that drop coverage. And if Darius got into the paint, they were just saying like, hey, go ahead, take the floater, try and finish at the rim. We're not going to collapse all the defense around you. That's why he, and I think in overtime especially, he did a really good job, him and Allen, of just getting downhill he was making great decisions. He had a couple floaters, and whenever the defense finally would come up, it was kind of like vintage DG where he's kind of toying with that help defender. So that's when he's at his best, but it's just really easy for teams to adjust and take that away at the end of games. That's why you need Donovan Mitchell. I think moving on to the second lesson that we've learned, this is a little earlier in the year, and really you can go all the way back to last season. Jared Allen in the summer was called expendable and every other name in the book. And this year, I think what we have learned throughout all these injuries is that he's pretty important to this Cavs team. He is very, very valuable, especially in the early stages of the season when we've kind of, I would say, learned that at least at this stage in Evan Mobley's development, he is not a five. You can't just run the one big lineup with Evan Mobley throughout 82 games and think that you're going to be the second seed or the third seed. It's very important that we have Jared Allen on this roster. And even when Mobley was in the lineup, Jared Allen is just, he's so good at what he does. He has been so important. He, he's been the one, aside from Donovan Mitchell, he has been one of the only common denominators in basically all of their biggest wins and their most important moments this year. So I just want to give Allen his flowers because he has been so good this year. Yeah, I think one of the things that we see when Mobley is out is that Allen comes out with, he has more, he has more responsibilities. So I think he kind of rises to the occasion in a way, not that he doesn't, have motivation when Mobley's out there, but I think some of the circumstances where it's like Allen needs to be attacking the rim really aggressively for the offense to work. He needs to be the focal point of the defense in a way that he doesn't always need to be with Mobley out there. So I think you just kind of get the best version of Mobley where I don't know if you get that best version when he is out there with Mobley. Actually, you don't get the best version, even if he is still good. So I think that's really what I'm taking away from this. And Allen's really good, you know. Rim running centers aren't in vogue, but Allen may be one of the best just traditional rim running centers who just has that really traditional skill set in the league. And you see that 
that can still lead to a really good defense, at least in the um, regular season. Brad did say in one of the recent games that he believes Jared Allen is the best center on both ends of the floor in the NBA. Which now, is, I don't agree with that at all, but I just had to bring it up because I thought it was very what, funny. One thing I want to say is that the phrase on both ends of the floor is the dumbest thing possible because, like, <laughs> you know, like nobody says Luca is a good defensive player, but he's one of the best mm-hmm. players in the league because he's so good on offense, yeah. and that's all that, like, he's exponentially better than anybody else on offense, so it, it doesn't really matter mm-hmm. what he's doing on defense. So, like, the phrase two-way player does just doesn't just never made sense to me. So that, and also there's like, sorry. I know you Why did you derail me like this? Why did you do this? He, he also said earlier in the year that Darius Garland's one of the best finishers at the rim he's ever seen. So we just need to do a segment of Brad sayings because I've, I've been holding this in. I just had to get it out here, man. He, I love him, but he, he says some crazy things sometimes. I sometimes think do- he hasn't watched basketball outside of the Cavs. <laughs> it's like it. half, half the time you see his reaction to players, he's like, oh my God, who is this guy? And it's like John Morant. And he's like, this guy yeah. is incredible. And then he usually takes know a what- shot at AC at some random point as AC got cooped up in like the booth in the top row. Yeah. <laughs> On his birthday. I know, how tragic. No, I think that's what Jared Allen also – really does well is that um, he takes advantage of modern defense where teams are trying to play smaller so they can play five out and teams have to acknowledge Jared Allen's presence and the other types of centers that aren't at Jared Allen's caliber are usually a older, B less athletic or physical. And Jared usually can take advantage of those matchups all the time. He also has a really good sense of how to operate off the role. I would say that's definitely like, He's in the top 1% in the league and being able to operate in that type of style of offense. We see that it works seamlessly with almost every pick and roll partner he has for the most part in this Cavs offense, whether it was Darius, Donovan, Struess at times, he just finds ways to the rim all the time. And going off Jackson's point, I feel like with uh, Jarrett that I think there's like some, co- some subconscious thing in like a player's mind when like you have Mobley, you know that if you could overcommit to something defensively that there's going to be another man behind you. But when you know that it's really kind of just you as that elite point of attack defender around the rim that he knows, like he doesn't overcommit and take more risks. So he just looks like a more solid overall player. One thing I do want to say is that I think Allen has done a lot better job of kind of being comfortable passing the ball. And it's, especially with those like dribble handoffs and stuff. I think he's done a really good job with those. And those, I feel like that's highlighted a lot more when he's not playing with Mobley. Cause a lot of times when he has to play mate with Mobley, it's like trying to force that little like alley-oop to him, which mm-hmm. is admittedly a tough play to, for like someone of his size to run. So I think, when he's out there on his own, it kind of highlights how good he is as a playmaker when he's kind of asked to do center things. In the four games since Mobley has been out, Allen is averaging 20 points, 14 rebounds, and almost three assists. Um, he was really good in that Minnesota game. And uh, I'll, I'll even say, just to run some defense for him too, because I see some people on Twitter say this at times, where they criticize him for his hands, not being able to catch the ball. If you look at some of the passes he gets thrown his way, Jared Allen, I think, uh, like, without a doubt, has some of the best hands in the NBA. It is not easy to catch some of those passes that Darius Garland throws to him. And Garland's a great playmaker. But, like, I just don't think, like, it always drives me crazy when I see people say that, like, Jared Allen has questionable hands. I'm like, dude, do you know how difficult it is to catch? Like, have you watched Damian Jones play basketball? Did you watch when Tristan was out there? Like, it's not easy to catch those passes. And he, I mean, I know he missed the, the lob against Phoenix, but, like, even that one, that no one should have been able to catch that. So I just had to run some defense from there too because it that drives me crazy. Well, Darius throws bowling ball heaters underhand like Ooh, he's in yeah. the women's softball league, <laughs> like two feet away from him. <laughs> who is who is giving you these takes, Tony? You gotta, I, you I gotta do better. I can't call this them is out. on this is on you for this is on you for like allowing these type of people into your life. No, actually, I will say another thing that drives me crazy with the Allen takes sometimes is that like listen. If Devin Booker is crashing from the perimeter and either getting a rebound or tapping the rebound out, that's usually not Jared Allen's fault. If a guard or a wing is coming from the perimeter, like he can't box out everybody. Now, of course, it's his job. Like, I feel like a lot of fans, it's just like, oh, well, he's the center. So he's the one who should be getting all the rebounds. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, 
he can only do so much. It, it, it's something that always drives me crazy. Josh Hart gets 19 rebounds and it's Jared Allen's fault. Like sometimes we have to look at this a little deeper than just say, well, he's the tall one. He's six, eight or six, nine or six, 10 or so whatever Google says, they give him every single height. If you Google it, but he, he's like, he's like six, seven tops. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but the but he's, actually like six, he's actually like six, nine. Like he's not tall. Mm. No one knows how tall NBA players are. This is something that nine, I've been wanting answers you. for for a long time. Jackson, six we'll go nine, measure him. Confirm. No, like I go look at like media day pictures hmm. with him. Standing, there's like a picture with him standing with like Isaiah Mobley and Evan Mobley, and it's like him and Isaiah Mobley, and it was like Evan Mobley, and you're like, oh, it's a great, great picture you're you're drawing up for us. Yeah, that's let's move on to our last to topic. <laughs> Moving on to our last topic and maybe the last lesson that could be a hard lesson to be learned, uh, depending on what happens with this contract. I'm sure the Cavs are going to match it either way, but I think all the injuries that have happened this year have really opened up the door for a Coro to shine, to get opportunities that he might not have. Um, not that he's some crazy offensive weapon now, but he's shooting above 40% from the three-point line. Uh, since mid-February, he's averaging 13 points, almost three assists on 43% shooting on five attempts per game from downtown. And he's just been really great on both ends of the floor. Uh, Jackson, I know you've been a long time a Coro fan, so I'll let you take yes, this one away. You know, I've been telling people forever that this was coming and it finally came. No, I think, so like, I've been an Okoro skeptic for a while just because of you can't play two bigs and a guy on the perimeter who is basically like a big and where he's scoring from. But Okoro really has developed and kind of like those incremental developments have kind of reached like a tipping point where you can't just treat him the same way that you could like this time last year. Like this time last year, I remember they played the Sixers and in the fourth quarter, they just put Embiid on Okoro where Embiid's just standing in the lane the whole time. And when Okoro gets the ball, he takes one step out. Okoro is scared to shoot. Then he starts driving inside, and it's like, yeah, and beats there. What are you going to do, man? So it's like, there's really, like, that's not the guy who he, who he is now. And I think yesterday's game was really, was a really good indicator of that. He went two for seven from three. And I think we sometimes overrate his three-point shooting percentage because not all 40% shooters are created this, the same. You know, like mm. there's a Sam Merrill 40% shooter, there's a Max Drews yeah. 40% shooter, and then there's an Isaac Okoro 40% shooter. Like those are not all the same shooters. It's like open shots, catch and shoot, like right. easier shots. Low yeah, he's not. Right. But what Isaac has, really, one, he's not hesitating when he gets the ball. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like even when he does drive, he's doing it quickly and he has like we counters <laughs> in a way that he didn't have before where I I can see you guys fine. We can hear you at least. So I'm sure it's, it's like okay. every time we get well, your the video, point, it pauses on sometimes. the point. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know what's wrong with my internet. So we're hoping that Verizon will take care of us. But as of now, there's nothing I can do. At least the um, core is taking care of us. Back to I, right. Back to, back to Isaac. So when, what he's doing now is he has counters and when he's driving to the basket and he does get cut off, he has things to do besides just kind of like pick up the ball and panic. Like I think against the, against the uh, Hawks, he had a couple nice Euro steps in half court where it's like, he's opening up lanes for himself. He's finishing through contact so much better. He has like a wider layup package, if that makes sense. And he's even like, he's comfortable operating like the pick and roll as the ball handler, like he's just doing a lot of things. And then when you add in, oh, he's doing stuff as a screener where he's doing pick and pops, he's doing pick and rolls. Like when you start adding all those things up together, you're getting an offensive player who is capable. He like he's not a like no one's going to say Isaac Okor is a great offensive player, mm -hmm. but he's a very capable offensive player. And when you're that level of defender who can do the things that he did against Anthony Edwards on Friday. It's like, there's always room on the court for somebody like I, like this version of Isaac Okoro, even if you're running a too big lineup, I guess in some sort circumstances that changes, but like, that's a really valuable guy right there. 
the Cavs have gotten themselves into a situation where you didn't want them. You felt like when Okoro was out there prior, you were sometimes just running a four on five offensively at all times. Mm-hmm. And now that the fact that Okoro is buying into his confidence, because he's always, he's shown these types of skills and flashes. And then you kind of were hoping that they would kind of string together as the season goes along, but as confidence would come and go, it would wane and wax. And now it just feels like you're kind of due to the opening of minutes and this level of confidence he gained in the off season. We're just seeing a version of a Coro that doesn't make you feel like you're at a disadvantage offensively. And he is just playing to the level. I think that he's shown he's capable of, but just when push comes to shove, due to all the injuries, this was probably the best outcome for Okoro heading into the season. Like, Okoro's oh, yeah, actually, definitely. he's, he's like, actually playing basketball, and I, like, if you're ever playing pickup and you're in a situation where you're like, these guys are so much better than me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stand in a corner, and, like, if I get the ball, I'm going to shoot it, or if somebody closes out, I may try to take a dribble and pass it. Like, that's kind of how Isaac played before, where he was, like, scared to almost mess up what everyone else is doing because he didn't I don't know if he didn't believe in himself or if or what the deal was but he kind of mm-hmm. played like that whereas now he's like playing basketball like he's doing basketball things on the basketball court on the on the offensive side and that's where it's like yeah those skills that you kind of showed now you're actually able to use them in a wide variety of ways because it's never that Isaac hasn't been skilled it's that it seems like Either he doesn't believe in himself enough or the team doesn't believe in him enough to let him showcase those skills in a way that he is doing right now. I feel like offenses prior didn't really give Alcoro a chance to kind of use his skills. I feel like when you watched his college tape, the last thing you kind of thought was, hey, you know where he would do really well? Stand in the corner and just be a corner shooter. His shot was literally the number one critique of his offensive game, and they kind of forced him to be in that role because he's like, hey, you're going to be our three. So you're going to stretch the floor and then you can attack if they decide to crash out on you. No one's going to crash on you, Isaac, because you can't shoot. (laughs) So we're going to beg you to shoot. And then he's kind of like Jackson said, like the guy in pickup who's like, well, I guess if I'm open, I should shoot it. Or if they crash, it's like, oh, crap. Now what am I going to do? Because I can't Mm -hmm. I don't have any confidence in my dribble because his his handle was pretty suspect for Mm -hmm. the first few years. It kind of just felt all everything felt awkward and mechanical. Nothing was fluid. And now, like, we're seeing, like you said, like so many different types of sets run for him. Never in my life did I really think I'd see an Isaac Okoro pick and roll ever come to flourish. And a pick and pop. I know. I think, I forget what team it was against, but he did a pick and pop. He had a play where he drove in kind of in isolation almost and, like, did a between the legs dribble move and then reset and attacked again. I was like, what is this Isaac Okoro I'm watching? (laughs) It's crazy. Um, Like, in the past, you really especially if the Cavs are losing a game, like you can't have a guy out there who's just standing in the corner and not even really shooting that often either. Like he would just stand in the corner and he would take it if he's super, super open. But other than that, it was just kind of like you pass the ball to him and the offense gets reset. You can have a guy out there who's going to shoot two of seven, even if that's not a great shooting percentage. He's shooting the ball. He's handling the ball. He's a part of the offense. He's not just standing in one spot. You, you'll go down at the loss that way with a guy who's actually playing basketball versus a guy who's just kind of standing there. And you're hoping that you can win in spite of the limitations that he brings. Now it's like, hey, even if Okoro doesn't have the best shooting night or he isn't able to attack the rim as much as we'd want, like we know he's going to do a certain job on the floor and we can trust him to do his best at it. Because if he does bring anything offensively, you get to keep him out there longer and you get to have, like we saw against Minnesota, where he can just completely shut down some of the best players in the NBA. I don't think he's going to get an all defensive nod, but he's definitely deserving of hefty consideration. And hopefully one of these days in the future, because who knows, he could still get better. I don't think anyone thought that he was going to continue to get better defensively, but he has. Yeah. One of the things is that he has such good athleticism and he's just really like, he's a really good frame and stuff. So like he's somebody who can just really, when he gets downhill and he has good touch, like, those are all things that you really want from a like an NBA player. So he's just trying he's just slowly figuring out how to actually use them all. So I think the scary thing is that there's still a much better version of Isaac Okoro in there, especially I think on both sides of the ball there's still a better version of him. So that's where it's like it like he's a good player, but he could get even better. So mm. 
the thing about Okoro is the archetype he was kind of laying out was where you were kind of expecting that this was just going to turn into a Matisse Thibel 2.0 situation where it's like, God, Matisse Thibel defensively is great. And if he could hit down a shot too, that would also be great. Matisse Thibel, though, as we all know, is like on his third team now and <laughs> has not had the shot. Shot, for shot not developed. <laughs> and that was like, I think, in the back of every Cavs fan's mind and why the team obviously didn't uh, sign go for that uh, extension yet because it's like we kind of know it could be there, but it wasn't. And it's mm-hmm. just a relief, I think, to all everyone that it, Okoro – confidence has taken him out of that and now it's kind of like what more can he do versus god i hope he does something yeah and to that point that i'll make this last point then we can wrap up if you compare a coro to any of those other like matisse thibel type players where you're just hoping if he ever develops a shot and then he'll be a valuable player i think maybe in the past you could have said this but right now like it does not look painful when a coro takes a three-point shot it looks great when Okoro takes a three-pointer from anywhere, from the corner, from above the break. When he takes a three, you genuinely feel like it has a chance of going in. Whereas any time with Thibault or any of those other billion 3 and D, 3 and D wings, it just looked ugly. It looked painful. It looked like he was forcing up a shot. And at times throughout Okoro's career, it felt like that too. But this season, that's not the case. Anytime he lets it go, that thing looks fluid and I feel like it's going in. And that's a really good breakthrough to have for a player who's still very young. That's going to do it for this episode of the Junkyard Pod. I want to thank everyone for watching and listening. If you want to be in our Twitter group chat, all you have to do is subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Send me proof, and I'll get you added. And go Cavs. One thing real quick, guys. I have a story about Bradley Beal and Darius Garland coming out. I, did I did I just freeze again? No, you're good. What, why are you laughing at me? <laughs> it's I didn't know where the story was going to go. <laughs> I have, no, I have a story about... I'm sorry about Bradley Bill because he was the AAU coach for Darius Garland throughout high school. So I have a story. I was able to ask Bradley Bill a couple questions about it, and he gave some really good answers about Darius Garland's growth and development and what he wants to see from him. So I think it's a really good story, and it's going to come out on Wednesday, hopefully, or Thursday for Fear the Sword. So keep your eyes I will, for that, I guys. will be tweeting it. Yeah, you didn't tweet my last one, so you know. Tony doesn't tweet any of my stuff. (laughs) I'm just here to die. He doesn't even tweet.